and uh, started a career in London School of Economics branch in Singapore. Uh, after that, uh, after uh, relieving from London School of Economics branch, joined in Center for Development Studies. Uh, I would say he is the real genius of econometrics. He can clarify any questions uh, regarding econometrics. Uh, this professor is living with the econometrics. I personally experienced a person living with econometrics. He can ask anything about the econometrics team. And so he specialized in energy economics, development economics, political economy, applied statistics, econometrics. Uh, and these are the specialized areas. So over to you, sir. So we can start. Uh, Thank you. Okay, so there are some questions, uh, questions raised uh, uh, in the chat box, sir. Can I read it? Which one? Yeah. Yeah. So, so questions like uh, uh, if the residual is purely random. Can we say that our model is adequate? That was one question raised by Lena George. Yes, yes. That uh, residual being random, we have to test in many respects. That's the only thing. Random means there is no pattern. No pattern means there is no information. All the information in the data set has been taken by our estimated model so that residual does not contain any information. That is why the residual becomes a random variable. So if the residual is random variable, then our model is adequate. But this we have to see in a number of tests. Now those tests, now I am detailing. That's one more question uh, asked by Lena George again. How do we know residual is purely random? Yeah, that is that is what we are doing now. Yeah, coming classes. Yeah. Then is it possible to solve non-linear parameters by OLS? If no, it is we not. transform the parameters See, into the dog, will it remain unbiased? See, actually in econometrics by linearity mean we mean the linearity in parameters, not the variables. If the variables are in squared or cube terms, doesn't mean, doesn't pose any problem for estimating it using OLS. So, if the parameters are linear, then any equation we can estimate using OLS. If the parameters are not linear, then we have to go for nonlinear least squares method, not the OLS. Okay, sir. Clear, sir. Yeah. Sir, we can continue with the uh, yeah. previous slide. Yeah. So, whether we have a normal residual or not, we can use a normal probability approach, PP, PP curve. So this, the, in this particular case, if the residuals are along this straight line, that is an indication that the residuals are following a normal distribution. On the other hand, if it is like this, then it means that we have the residuals as positively skewed. Similarly, if the pattern is like this, then it means that the distribution is heavily tailed, heavy tailed distribution. But not that normal distribution does not have heavy tail, but other distributions, including T distribution, Gombert's distribution, all these are heavy tailed ones. So if our residuals, residual distribution is heavy tailed like this, then it means that we do not have normality pattern. Now, these this, uh, residual plots are not uh, enough 
in themselves. We need statistical tests. We have a statistical test. We have a large number of statistical tests for non normality, but the most popular one is the Raki Bera test. Carlo Raki and Anil Bera. So in this test, both the stimulus and kurtosis of a distribution are used together. So the formula is given here, S is the skewness and K is the kurtosis. If skewness is zero and K equals three for a normal distribution, then the JV statistic is zero. That means we have a normal distribution. If S equals zero and K equals three. Otherwise, if the p-value for this statistical test is greater than 5%, then we cannot reject the null hypothesis of non-normality. Okay, the hypothesis of non-normality. Sorry, the if the p-value is greater than 5%, then the null hypothesis, see the null hypothesis here is not non-normality but normality. That is the residuals are normally distributed that we cannot reject. So once more I shall tell if the p-value is greater than 5 percent then the residuals are normally distributed. There is no problem of non-normality. And for that matter in advance I shall give you one information for our for all the model adequacy tests our p-value must be greater than 5%. If our p-value is greater than 5% for all the model adequacy tests, then it means our model is adequate. There is no problem at all. That model we can use for our hypothesis testing and the further we can go for forecasting. So, the p-value must be greater than 5%. So here also it is like that. Now what are the remedies if we have not normally distributed errors? So one thing we have to modify our theory and try it. Then see whether there are any omitted variables and whether there is any outlier also, we can modify our functional form by taking some variance transform step, such as getting square root, exponentiation, logs, etc. So we can try for taking logarithmic transformation or taking the square root of the data or getting a power of that particular data and so on, and try to move. So that way we can try, we can modify our our data set. Now the next one is multicollinearity. As I have already told you, multicollinearity refers to the relationship among the independent variables. The most problematic multicollinearity is when the variables are perfectly correlated. In that particular case, the estimation will, will stop, cease, and the computer will tell that it cannot proceed further. And we have the condition where the estimation approaches singularity. Approaches singularity or this singularity means that we cannot estimate the particular model. So, if we have perfect multicollinearity among the independent variables, then it is not possible to estimate the model. So remember, the this is a sample problem, and therefore we have to do some something with the sample to avoid this particular problem. We will come to the remedies later. Now, multicollinearity is always there among all the datasets. And uh, it is a problem of degree, 
approach just to the process. So that means multiple linearity can appear in different degrees. We have the two extremes. At one, at one extreme, we have perfect multicollinearity. And the other extreme, we have no multicollinearity at all. Between these two limits, we have different degrees of multicollinearity. So I shall tell you about this, okay, these three cases now. So let us now consider the case of no multicollinearity at all. That is, all the data sets are independent of each other. No correlation at all among the x variables. That means the x variables are orthogonal to each other. So in this case, even if we, suppose we have two independent variables, x1 and x2. We, if we go for a multiple regression, then the regression coefficients will be equivalent to a simple regression, simple regression coefficients. That means if the explanatory variables are not multicollinear, then we can go for bivariate simple regression. Now remember, this is the only case we can go for bivariate simple regression. In all other cases, where there is some multicollinearity among the independent variables, we must go for multiple regression. So, if there is no multicollinearity, then only we can go for simple regression of bivariate one. I have seen many, many researchers doing, taking, considering several variables, but taking two variables at a time and, and giving a large number of bivariate regressions. This practice is wrong. We have to go for multiple regression, not the bivariate one. Bivariate regression is possible only if we have mul no multicollinearity among the independent variables. In, in that particular case, remember, if we go for a multiple regression, the multiple regression coefficients will be the same as the coefficients from a bivariate regression. That is the case. So the next case is the other extreme, that is the perfect multicollinearity case. So this is the singularity problem. In this case, take any two variables, x1 and x2, and uh, perfect multicollinearity appears if x1 is equal to k x2, where k is not equal to zero. That is, k can be any number, positive or negative. Maybe x1, if k is equal to 1, then x1 is x2. If k equals 2, then x1 is twice x2, and so on. In that case, we have perfect multicollinearity, and we have the singularity problem. We are not able to estimate the parameters. The computer will crash. Between these two cases, we have imperfect multicollinearity. This is the more common problem among most of the independent variables. This is there, the imperfect multicollinearity is there, and that is why we have to go for the multiple regression. Here, we are able to estimate the parameters and they are unbiased. But the problem is with their standard errors, that is their variance. The variance is not the minimum. The variance is not the mean. Now, if the variance is not the minimum, then that, what, what are the implications? That is, if there is high correlation among the independent variables, we will have an inflated variance of the estimator, the, the parameter estimate, beta k hat. In this case, the T ratios will be lower because we have a higher variance or higher standard error. Therefore, the T ratio will be lower. And that means the beta k hat will become insignificant. 
At the same time, we find R squared tending to be very high. And we have a we will have a significant F statistic also. So multicollinearity is there when we have significant that is very high F value, very high R squared, but very low T values. Remember, if we have very high R squared, if we have very high R squared, then the F value will be very high. But at the same time, if we have very low T ratio, then that is an that is an indication of multicollinearity. Along with that, sometimes there may be a change of the sign for some variables. Some variables will change sign. We may be expecting positive sign, but we find negative sign for that. On the whole, the estimates will be unbiased, but we will have these particular problems. Now, among for the tests, for the indicators for multicollinearity, I am reporting two indicators. One said to be the most useful single diagnostic guide by J. Johnston in his textbook on econometrics is the variance inflation factor. I'm not going into the details of this because we don't have time. But in most of the packages, we get the variance inflation factor. How do we interpret that variance inflation factor? If variance inflation factor is close to one, that means there is no multicollinearity. But if it is greater than 10, then it is problematic. And usually we take this 10 as a, as a yardstick. Any VAF greater than 10 is said to be indicating a problematic multicollinearity. Otherwise, the multicollinearity is not a problem. This VAF of 10 indicates that to the 90 the probability is severe. That is, 90% of the variance of xj, a, a one variable, is explained by other variables, other independent variables. Even though the usual criterion is a VIF greater than 10, in small samples, we have to consider a VIF of about 5. So, these are the two values that we have to keep in mind. Then, corresponding to the variance simulation factor, we have another measure called tolerance, which is the in the reciprocal of the variance inflation factor. If the tolerance equals one, that means the variables are unrelated. If it is equal to zero, then that means the variables are independent variables are perfectly correlated. Because the variance inflation factor will be will be an infinite one. Now the second indicator is given by Wellesley in 1991 in terms of what is called a condition index or condition number. Some of the textbooks uh, refer to these Wellesley's indicators also, and this. Both the index and the number, condition index and the condition number are taken from the eigenvalues of the matrix of x prime x, where x is the data matrix. Now, from the data matrix, from that x prime x, we will have a number of eigenvalues, lambda 1, which is greater than lambda 2, and so on. That is the eigenvalues given in ascending in, in descending order so that lambda 1 is the highest eigenvalue. Then the condition index is defined as this lambda 1 divided by a particular lambda j. J can be 1, 2, 3 and so on. Now in stata and the SPSS, <coughs> the condition index is given in terms of the square root. Now we have 
another measure called the condition number. This is the square root of the maximum eigenvalue that is lambda one and the minimum eigenvalue that is the last lambda one. That is, it is the square root of maximum C i j. So these two indicators are used for multicollinearity measure. And they have given this criteria for multicollinearity test. That is the if the largest condition index is 5 to 10, that means there is no problem. If it is between 30 to 100, then there is some problem of multicollinearity. If we have the largest condition index in terms of more than 1000, then the multicollinearity is a severe problem. Now, what are the causes of multicollinearity? The usual sampling mechanism can generate multicollinearity. That is purely constructed design and measurement scheme for the limited range of the sampling mechanism. Then statistical model specification also can generate multicollinearity. That is adding polynomial terms of the trench indicators. If we take, say, suppose we have one in the independent variable x1. If we take the square of that, x1 squared or cube of that, then there will be multicollinearity. Then if there are too many variables in the model, that is if the model is overdetermined, then that also can cause multicollinearity. Then our finally our theoretical specification can go wrong and cause multicollinearity. Now, what are the remedies for this? One remedy is to increase sample size and it can work sometimes, not always. So, then the other case is to omit the collinear variables. Now, suppose we have three variables, x1, x2, x3 as collinear, multicollinear. If they are highly collinear, then we can omit two variables and go with the regression of having one variable only. But there is a problem with this. If we omit the variables, then there will be omitted variable bias and that will that will lead to specification bias, specification problem. And moreover, if we want to have differential impact size of different variables, then we cannot omit variables. Suppose we have the variables income and say wealth in a consumption function. Consumption as a function of income and wealth. Of course, there is multicollinearity between the two independent variables, income and wealth. But if we want to find the marginal effect of income and wealth separately, then we should have both the variables in the regression. That is the case. So we cannot go for omitting the variables. Then the another alternative is to go for constructing some scale. That is, we can we can find an average of the three variables x1, x2, x3, and get a representation of all the three variables. But the problem of differential marginal effect size remains there. So we, we, it, it, is, it is not advisable to go for a scaling technicals. Similarly, we can go for a scale in terms of factor analysis. We have a, if we have a large number of variables, large number of independent variables, multicollinear, then we can go for a factor analysis that is, we can go for what is called a data reduction. That is variable, number of variable reduction. We, we can go for a factor analysis in specifying a few factors to represent all other variables, all the variables. But here also we have the problem of getting the 
getting the differential marginal effect size of each vegetable. So that also is not a Then what we can do is to constrain the estimation, but that is setting the value of one coefficient relative to another. That is get some relative measure. If we have two variables, x1 and x2, which are collinear, then we can take a ratio of these two. But there, in there also we have the problem of not getting the differential impact. So most of these remedies are not, not, are not advisable. So we go for the last one, that is just cross over i to its multicollinearity problem. That is just ignore it and report the adjusted R squared and say that we have to retain these variables in the model. Otherwise, there will be omitted variable by us and we will not be able to get the differential impacts. So, in general, the advice is to ignore multicollinearity. Now we come to the model specification problem, that is the specification error. So the specification error, we have four types. This I have already told you earlier. That is, we may exclude a relevant variable or we may include an irrelevant variable or there may be functional for misspecification or there may be measurement error or misspecified error J. That is, we may have too many or too few variables. Now, what are the implications of that? What, are, what is the implication that if we include an, a variable in our specification that do not belong to that? that is including an, a variable that is irrelevant to our model. The implication is that there is no effect on our parameter estimate. The OLS estimates remain unbiased. There is no problem at all. On the other hand, if we exclude a relevant variable from our model, then the OLS estimates will be usually biased. So these are the two implications for the first two problems. So the first one is excluding a relevant variable that is underfitting bias. Suppose the true model is with the two variables x1 and x2, but we estimate the model only with the one variable. So the misspecified model will be a bias too. In the second case, our true model is having only one variable, but we estimate including an irrelevant variable. In this case, actually there is no problem at all. Both beta 1 and beta 2 will be estimated unbiasedly. But there is a problem for the variances of beta 1 and beta 2. If x1 and x2 are correlated, if there is multicollinearity between x1 and x2, then the variances of beta 1 hat and beta 2 hat will not be minimum. We know it is an inflated one. The variances are inflated one. So the estimates are not efficient. They are unbiased but they are not efficient. The third type of the function, the misspecification occurs when we go for some functional form misspecification, incorrect functional form. For example, if the true regression model is not linear and we go for a linear regression, then we are having this problem. And actually, if we are committing an incorrect functional form specification, then 
it can lead to autocorrelation for heterosensitivity for both. Now, what about the testing for the specification error? We have a research. Research is given by Ramsey, and this is said to be Ramsey's regression specification error test. RE regression specification error test. So the null hypothesis is no specification error. And if the p value is greater than 5%, that means our model does not have any specification problem. Remember, I told you earlier, all the model analysis tests should have a 5%, should have a greater than 5% p value. In that case, our model will be adequate. Now, we have two more assumptions, and these two assumptions are related to our spherical error assumptions. One is about the no heteroscedasticity assumption of the error table. That is, we have an assumption of homoscedasticity. Variance of U e, UI is a constant sigma goes point. Then the second one is that there is no serial autocorrelation. So we may have serial or autocorrelation problem if the covariance among the residu the residuals or the error table is not zero. Now that we, we are taking the first case that is the heteroscedasticity assumption. Now see here I have given three distributions distributions and here we have the mean in all the distributions the mean is given here so what are the implications of these distributions for the variance of that particular random variable that we consider anybody can tell me don't take much time anybody can you tell me the, the implication for variance of the random variable here or here or in this case. Anybody? What is it? In the first case, the variance ah. is less, whereas ah. in the last case, the variance hmm. is more. Ah, very high. And this is an intermediate one, right? So here the here the variance pressure is very small. That is, all the values are very close to mu. That is why we have a small variance. Here that is not the case. The values are distributed away from mu considerably, substantially. So the variance will be very high. Now, if we have the explanatory variables like this x1, x2, and so on. And the error variance is given like this. Then this is a homoscedasticity case. That is the error variance is the same with respect to both the independent variables. So we have the case of homoscedasticity. On the other hand, if we have a case like this for the three independent variables, x1, x2, x3. The variances are different. The error variances are different. So we have the problem of heteroscedasticity. Now, if we have the problem of heteroscedasticity, then the residuals will have a fan or a funnel shape like this. This is a fine or funnel shape, or more clearly like this. So here we have a funnel shape or a fan shape. Here also we have a funnel or fan shape. That is not the case here. Here the variance is constant. So we can have a diagrammatic representation of heteroscedasticity 
if we plot residuals against the independent variable and the residuals are like this like a fan or funnel now the implications of heteroscrasticity are like are this now here also just like our multicollinearity problem the parameter estimates are unbiased and they are consistent also that is the asymptotic property also is available but the problem is they are no longer the best estimator their variances will be very high that is the problem so in general they are not blue that is they are not we do not have the minimum variance property they are not efficient estimators so if they do not have minimum variance then we will not have minimum standard error then that will lead us to wrong inference and we will have invalid confidence intervals also then there are different types of heteroscrasticity we may have heteros additive heteroscrasticity or multiplicative one or an arch one which is a time series problem that is auto regressive conditional heteroscrasticity that is the arch problem so such type such such a type of heteroscrasticity also we have to see as a for the model adequacy among the model adequacy tests so we will come to this later so when we take up the density analysis we will be seeing this arch case now what are the process for heteroscrasticity earlier we have already told if there is any omitted variable case for improper functional form that can lead to heteroscrasticity or autocorrelation then there may be some learning behaviors across time among the economic agents that can also lead to heteroscrasticity then changes in data collection for definitions then outliers or some breakdown in the model so these are the process of heteroscrasticity then for testing we have a large number of tests for heteroscrasticity we can we can use the ramsey reset test itself or we can go for some other tests among all these most popular are the bruch pagan test and the white test now i shall give a comparison between the bruch pagan and the white test the bruch pagan test will detect the linear forms of heteroscrasticity whereas the white test allows for non linearities also so it is better that we go for the white test now what are the remedies for heteroscrasticity we have two remedies they are the indirect and direct remedies the indirect remedies come in two forms that is either we can re specify the model and then re estimate it or with the same model we can use what is called wise robust standard error which is a heteroscrastic consistent standard error a standard error that is consistent with heteroscrasticity so the first such standard error was given by white in 1980 and that is why it is called white robust standard error so we can use the robust standard error if there is any heteroscrasticity problem the second remedy is a direct one that is we go for another least squares method which is called generalized least squares method or weighted least squares method in this particular case what we do is we adjust the data set completely so that we will get 
a homoscholastic a homoscholastic error table for the given data set with that homoscholastic data set we go for our estimation as usual in the OLS. So that is the generalized displays for GLS method. Now about the robust standard arrays, remember the robust standard arrays have only asymptotic distribution. So they have only asymptotic justification. So if we have a small sum, then it is better that we, we do not go for the robust standard error. The inference will not be correct. Then coming to the GNS, generalized least squares method, as I have already told you, what we do is, what we do here is, we go to transform the model into, into, a, into another one with a homoscholastic error table. So that is, we go, we wait, we give some weight to the data sets. That is why it is called the weighted least squares and transform the entire data set so that the error table will become homoscholastic. I'm not going into the details of this one because it will, it will take a lot of time. So just remember, we have the direct measure, we have the direct estimation method in terms of GLS or weighted least squares method. Now coming to the autocorrelation problem, we know this is the this shows that the arrays are not correlated over time. That is the our assumption shows that the correlation the there is no autocorrelation among the error types. Now if we go for a residual plot, a diagrammatic representation of our residuals residuals plotted against time. Then if we find a cyclical pattern, then that is an indication of positive autocorrelation. Positive autocorrelation. Now we have different types of autocorrelation. One is the, the usual autoregression, or we say autoregressive process, AR. And then they, we have another one moving average process. I shall give a small introduction to these cases because again, remember in the time series analysis, we will be discussing these autoregressive and moving average processes. Combining this, we will get what is called the ARMA autoregressive moving average process. So an autoregressive process says that the error tape or the residuals are related to their previous variance. Here, UT, the error tape is, error tape at time T is related to its own previous variance. That is why it is called an auto-regression. This is a regression of UT on its own past variance. So hence, auto-regression. So this is said to be a first order auto-correlation or auto regression because we are missing only one lab, T minus one. We are missing only one lab. We can have higher levels of auto regression. For example, if we use two labs, then we have an AF2. And in general, if we use P labs, then we have an ARP. In all these cases, remember the current error game is regress down its own past values, all the past values. And that is why it is called the auto, auto regression. Now, the moving average is different from the auto regression in that the current error tail is regress down. The current error tail, this epsilon t is a disturbance, okay, and uh, some other random error t and its past value that is epsilon t minus 1. So our residual we are regressing on 
and a, an error, a, a random error came and its positive values. Here we are using one lab, therefore we have an MA1 process. We can have an MAQ with the Q lab, and that is we are using the error tape epsilon t, epsilon t minus 1, and so up to epsilon t minus q. So our this disturbance tape is a function of some random error and its own past values. Now we can compare AR and MA process like this. So we get what is called an ARMA PQ model. That is the error team is regressed on its own past values. That is the auto regression. And then some other ran random error team and its sir, past sir. values. So this is ah, auto correlation. Sorry. So sir, uh, can you explain the previous slide slides one more time? This one. Uh, from uh, Ar Arma itself. Arma itself. Uh, from Arma onwards, sir. Arma onwards. That is that is this word. Or ah, air. Okay, sir. You mean air. Air, air, air. air. <laughs> See, air means. See, air means we have we have our error claim. Which is regressed on its own past value, ut minus 1. Okay, that is an auto regression or auto correlation. Ut, the correlation between ut and ut minus 1. So we can have higher orders, AR2 or ARP in general. Everywhere we have ut regressed on its own past values. And remember, we will have. An error term for that also. That is given by this epsilon t. Now, the moving average process is given is given by specifying the this ut in terms of so, ut in terms of this t and its past value that is epsilon t and its past value that is the ma1 process if we have more lab for epsilon values epsilon variables then we have maq model now we can combine this arp and maq as an arma pq that is we have ut in terms of its own Past two values and the random error team and its own past two values. So this is the ARMA PQ model. We will we will learn this when we come to the tech series class. So we have already this autocorrelation AR or MA. Now the implications are just like our heteroscedasticity if there is autocorrelation then the estimates are still unbiased but they are not blue that is the they are they they are not efficient ones the variance of the estimate is not minimum now the process this also we have already seen in the case of the heteroscedasticity so if there is an omitted variable, wrong functional form, or lag defects, or if we are doing some data transformation, that also can cause autocorrelation. For example, differencing. If we do the differencing, then that can cause autocorrelation. For testing, we have a simple measure called the Durban Watson statistic or D statistic. And this D statistic lies between 0 and 4. If D is around 2, then that means there is no first order autocorrelation. See, the Durbin Watson statistic will test only the first order autocorrelation. Higher order autocorrelations cannot be tested by 
the DW statistic or simply D statistic. And if this D statistic is around 2, that means there is no first order autocompletion. If D is less than 2 or close to 0, then that means there is positive autocompletion. And if D is greater than 2 or close to 4, that means there is negative autocompletion. This I am giving in this case, we have 0, DL, DU, then this, oh, okay, I shall give the next one. Here we are, we are including all the, the, the entire limit that is between 0 and 4 for the D statistic. And we know that this estimated D statistic, we have to compare with the table value for the D statistic. In the table value, there is a lower limit and an upper limit where the test is inconclusive. So we cannot get to a conclusive, conclusive result in if the if our estimated uh, D statistic lies here. Similarly, there is an inconclusive range between 4 minus DU and 4 minus DL. Otherwise, if our D statistic is around 2, then there is no autocorrelation. So, what is our null hypothesis? Null hypothesis is there is no autocorrelation. No autocorrelation. So, if it is close to 0, then that means there is positive autocorrelation. And if it is close to 4, then that means there is negative autocorrelation. So, these are the cases. Here we have all the four cases. In general, the remember if the D statistic is around 2, that means there is no first order autocorrelation. Now, this is only for the first order autocorrelation. For the higher order autocorrelations, we have some other testing procedures. And the, mainly we have one testing procedure in terms of what is called a Bruch Bagan autocorrelation test. So those autocorrelation tests we have to do, we can do in Gretil and the similar statist similar statistical software. So we will do that in our afternoon session. Now here, this doesn't matter. Okay. Now suppose in this particular case, the D statistic is estimated as one, and the one is much less than two, and uh, therefore we can conclude that there is positive autocorrelation. Now I told you. One problem of the Durban Watson statistic that uh, it is dealing with only with the, the first order autocorrelation. Now the Durban Watson statistic is is inapplicable or it fails in interpretation of autocorrelation if there is a lagged endogenous variable in our model. So, DW statistic, in, in that particular case, the DW statistic will ap approach a value of 2, showing that there is no autocorrelation, even if there is autocorrelation in the results. So, that is the problem with the Darwin's D, Darwin version D statistic. That is, if we have a lagged dependent variable in our model, lagged dependent variable in our model, we cannot use DW statistic. In such case, for testing the first order autocorrelation, we have another test given by Darwin in terms of Darwin's H. Darwin's H has a, norm, a standard normal distribution, therefore we can compare the Darwin's H with the, our usual 1.96 value. At 5% significance level, we know 1.96 is the critical value. If the 
that means x is greater than 1.96, then we will reject the null hypothesis of no autocorrelation. Otherwise, if Darwin's H is less than 1.96, that means there is no autocorrelation. That is, we are not rejecting the null hypothesis. Now, the remedy, as I told you, as in the case of the heteroscedasticity, we have the same generalized disquisite method, but in a different format. The GLS we apply here in terms of either a first difference method, that is, we take the first difference of our x variables and the dependent variable, and then regress delta y, the first difference of y or the first difference of our independent variables. And here we are assuming that the autocorrelation coefficient is equal to y. There is another method which is called generalized difference. In this particular case, we should know the value of the autocorrelation measure, that is a word. This is the Korshan worker method. I am not going into the details of this. What we have to do is, first we estimate our coins and get the residuals. Then using the, that particular residual, we regress the current value of the residual on one. Okay, we are we are regressing on one previous value of the residual. And uh, regressing like this, we will get an estimate of the autocorrelation coefficient. That is the row hatch. Then we use this row hatch in a generalized to difference formula like this. We multiply y t minus 1 with this rho hat, also multiply x t minus 1 with this rho hat, and then take the generalized difference like this, y t minus rho hat by t minus 1, and then regress this on the on a new constant and a new independent variable obtained by this difference. And then what we have to do is substitute the values of B1 and B2 into the original regression. That is this one here. And then we get a new measure of rho hat. And then again do this particular generalized difference regression. And go on like this until the rho hat no longer changes. Then we, we get, we, in, in that particular, we have, uh, we have arrived at what is called the convergence in the research. So, that particular research we can obtain. So, I am stopping here. You can ask me questions now. Yeah, participants can please unmute your mic and ask. Sir? Uh, Am I audible? Yeah. Sir, uh, regarding multicollinearity, uh, yeah. when I was using the eView software, yeah. when I was trying to estimate, the, the dialog box showed near singular matrix. That means yeah. my that means estimate. the singularity problem. Yeah. So, yeah, sir, can... then I, I had to drop one variable and then oh. only I could estimate. But, yeah. sir, you are telling that uh, that would cause, that is uh, biased. Yeah. Like, I wanted to keep that variable. Omitted, so, omitted variable uh, bias. Yes, so then what can I do, sir? The system, uh, the software will not uh, estimate only. So, in that case, even if I want to keep the variable, what can I do, sir? So, why don't you, why, why don't you do some transformation, for example, See, in, a, in, in, in one multiple regression, you can have a variable in log, another variable not log, and so on. So, you take the, you take some variables, you, you do some logarithmic transformation if, as a first step. Give all the variables a logarithmic transformation. 
and then try to estimate. If, if you find again the same problem, then the, the one of the variables you can go without load and try again. Sir, is it one? okay to take some with log and some without log? Hmm. No is problem. You, you have, no, there is no problem because the only the interpretation changes, right? Okay. Only the interpretation changes. Otherwise, there is no problem. Okay. You can do that. Some people say you have to take all the variables log, right? No, it need not be. Some variables you can take log. See, for example. Uh, you may have population data over the time, and the, the population data over the time may be may, may be may be becoming very high, higher and higher, right? If the population data are becoming very higher and higher over the time, that also means that there is a problem of heteroscedasticity. So to avoid that, you can normalize the population data by taking the logarithmic transformation. Only that way and put log of the population in your equation. There is no problem. You can do that. The only case is it will the interpretation changes. Now the interpretation is in change in, in terms of percentage. Otherwise, it is in terms of the unit. Here it is in terms of percentage. That's the only difference. You can do that. Okay, sir. Thank Otherwise, you, if you have a large number of X variables, all multicollinear, then you go for a factor analysis of all those variables. Suppose you have 10 variables, 10 such variables. You can find out three or four significant factors. That is factors having more than one eigenvalue. So instead of the uh, 10 variables, you can use these three or four factors. And these factors, you have to give some name representing the concerned variables. So you can go for that terms. The only case is you will not be getting the differential impact of all the variables, but you will get the differential impact of the composite indicator. Each factor is said composite indicator of the consent variables that you have to that you that particular name you have to give. see for example i shall i i, I, I shall I, uh, uh, I shall give the example of human development the human development indicator index is is a scale of three variables income that is a standard of living education and health right combining these two into one, one variable, we are getting a new variable, human development index. Similarly, combining variables, you have to give, depending upon the prominent variables in that factor, you have to give a name to the new composite index. Then you will be getting the marginal effect of that index, representing other, the, the main variables. So you can try that. Yes, thank you, yeah. sir. So, sir, uh -huh. sir, sir, uh, if we omit to one variable due to multicollinearity, hmm. how will it, it affect on autocorrelation and heteroscedasticity? Yeah, it it will because because that will. By, by omitting a particular variable, we are we are we are committing a specification bias or omitted variable bias, and that omitted variable bias will lead to will 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 lead to a, a biased estimator, and at the same time, see we are omitting a particular variable, and uh, omitting that particular variable will affect our error team. What idea? Why we are including an error team in a regression specification? Why we are including an error team in, a, in, a, in, a, in our model specification? See, for example, we are, we are including an error team to account for the omitted variable effects. 
to account for the omitted variable effect. That is the effect of the omitted variable. So the u vary the, the error term. If you are omitting a particular variable, then the error term will have its own change according to the omitted variable. It now improves the effect of the omitted variable bias. So naturally that can be to autocorrelation or heteroscrosity or both. That's the case. I hope you got the idea, right? Okay, okay, sir. Okay, sir. I got it. So, sir, can I ask one more question, sir? Sir, can you tell me what is the difference between uh, endogenous variable, control variable, and instrumental variable? I get confused. See the the term control variable we use in econometrics. See, in, in a multiple regression, suppose, suppose we are estimating a consumption function, consumption as a function of income and other variables. The other variables can be, say, household size, okay, size of the household, that is number of household members, then region of the household, whether the household is in urban area or rural area or uh, uh, tribal areas, etc. Then we can have some other variables also like occupation, education and all those things. Now, if we are interested in finding the differential impact of only income, then all other variables are control variables. We are using all other variables as control variables because all those other variables will have some effects on consumption and income. By including these other variables, control variables, what we are doing is we, we are removing their effects from consumption and income and the coefficient of income will give us the pure effect of income on consumption. That is after removing the effect of all other variables. That is why we say we are controlling the effect of other variables in a multiple regression. So the other variables are control variables. Now the dependent variable also is called, called response variable because it is responding to the treatment variable. In this case, income is the treatment. When we change income, there is an equivalent change in consumption, the pure effect of income or consumption, because we are controlling for the effect of other variables. So that is a case of control variables. Then endogenous variable. Endogenous variable is the dependent variable in, a, in, a, in an equation. So all the variables on the left hand side are endogenous variables. Endogenous variable is the variable that we determine within the system. We are determining within the system. That is whenever we change the value of income, the response variable by consumption also is changing. So we are determining its value. So consumption is an endogenous variable. What the idea? Then what else? Yes. Instrument variable. Yes. Instrument variable comes when we have the problem of the violation of the assumption of orthogonality between our explanatory variable and the error term. And this usually happens in a simultaneous equation system. In a, in a usual one equation system, this need not happen. Sometimes it can happen theoretically, so we have to be very careful in the, in the theoretical formulation of our model. That is the right hand side, right hand side explanatory variable should not be correlated with the error team. If it is correlated with the error team, then that variable will become an endogenous variable. So that we will have another equation with that variable as dependent one. 
So in such cases, whenever we have the orthogonality problem, problem or orthogonality assumption violated, then we have to go for some instrument variable instead of using, for example, household size. Household size and uh, say region. Suppose how okay, this is okay. Household size is correlated with the, uh, the error tip, suppose. Then we cannot use the household size as such because there is the problem of violation of the orthogonality assumption. So we have to find some other variable, some other variable which is highly correlated with the household size, but uncorrelated with the error tip. That is an instrument variable. What the idea? So an yes. instrument variable is uncorrelated with the error tip, but highly correlated with the variable under consideration. So that is the uh, instrument variable. Sometimes this instrument variable we estimate. For example, we can estimate the a through a regression the household size depending upon all other variables and get the estimated value. That estimated value is assumed to be independent of the error tip. So the estimated value we can use, estimated value of the household size we can use as an instrument in this equation. But remember this is in the framework of a simultaneous equation system. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Now, anything else? Sir, if uh, no questions, we can wind up and then yeah, we can. Yeah. Uh, okay, right, right. And yeah. we will start by 2 30. So, right? Ah, yeah, we will start by 2 30. Yeah, 2 30. Okay. Thank you all. Okay. Sir.